Hello. Today I'll talk about the implementation of an external DNS solution for Kubernetes for a recent project I have worked on. In this session, I'll be sharing my experience using the SLE and OpenSUSE based container images to build several containers used to implement an external DNS solution for a region project I have worked on. I'll provide a short demo at the end of the session. My name is Keith Berger, and I'm a senior software engineer at SUSE. I've been at SUSE for six years and came as part of an acquisition from HPE. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and have various hobbies and interests, such as smoking fish, baking, and cycling. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm a big Pittsburgh sports fan, especially the Steelers and the Penguins. For those of you from the Czech Republic that follow hockey, Yaromir Yager, play for the Penguins, is one of my favorite players. I will provide an agenda of today's session and the topics I will cover. What problem needs to be solved? What solution will be provided? First steps, looking at power DNS, looking at external DNS, Helm charts, some support tools and troubleshooting tips, a demo, and then time for questions. The Rancher Bare Metal Project uses the Ironic service to handle the bare metal deployment to the edge nodes. In order to provide a flexible solution and be compatible with Kubernetes Ingress resources, the Ironic endpoints are configured with host names and not IP addresses. How can we dynamically create the host names when the Ironic services are deployed? The initial prototype of the Rancher Bear Rental project was designed using external DNS. External DNS provides the ability to synchronize exposed Kubernetes services and ingresses with a customer's DNS provider. This initial design of the bare metal prototype used an Alpine Linux image to run external DNS. It was configured to integrate with Cloudflare as its DNS provider. The first part of the investigation was to see which self-hosted DNS options are available in OBS. Once that was completed, the next step was trying to create containers for the DNS solution and external DNS. One of the supported external DNS options is PowerDNS. PowerDNS has two separate packages. A recursor handles name resolution and is pre-configured to use the upstream root name servers. A second package, the authoritative server, provides a whitelist function such that the recursor can forward specific local domains to the authoritative server for resolution. This whitelist is part of the recursor's configuration. In addition, PowerDNS requires a database backend to store its records. Examining OBS showed packages exist for the Recursor, Authoritative Server, and SQL Lite 3. With this in mind, PowerDNS was chosen as the DNS solution for external DNS. With PowerDNS packages already in OBS, it would be easy to leverage the existing BCI container images. The investigation and testing phase revealed some areas that needed to be addressed. The first item was while the recursor will listen on port 53, the authoritative server should listen on some other port as it is only accessed from the recursor. In addition, the PDNS util tool should be available as it facilitates easy initialization of DNS records. During the test deployments, a few issues arose that needed to be addressed. The first was realizing we needed two containers and not just one. This is due to differences in the version numbers of the PDNS recursor and authoritative server in OBS. How would we track the image version if there were two variables? By splitting this into two containers, one for the recursor and one for the authoritative server, 
Each container version tracks the installed package version. A second issue was related to change in information on the SQLite DB location. When the container was deployed using a Kubernetes deployment or Helm chart, there were issues when the permissions of the SQLite DB directory were changed to the PDNS user. This was solved using a helper container that was run at startup as a privileged user and executed the required change own and change mod commands and then exited. The final issue was finding a stable version of PowerDNS in OBS. Initially linking to server DNS or OpenSUSE factory resulted in the container being frequently updated. It was discovered that the OpenSUSE backports SLE15 SP4 project contained a stable version that did receive CVE patches and such. The container images are now published under the ISV Metal 3 BCI project on OpenSUSE.org and they can be easily downloaded. The examples shown here use a SLE base but can easily be switched to Leap Tumbleweed by changing the from entry in the Docker file. External DNS is a Kubernetes add-on that allows the creation of dynamic host names from Kubernetes ingress objects and certain service types. It supports integration with a wide variety of DNS providers and servers. External DNS is a Go-based application. The upstream version of the external DNS container is based on Alpine Linux. That container has shell access disabled, which disables any troubleshooting other than the console logs. For example, ensuring it can connect to the configured DNS server it is using to create DNS records. Fortunately, there were many good examples of building Go applications already in OBS to use as a reference. The K9S package in OBS is a Go application and that was used as an example to create an external DNS package. Once that was done, the same method was used to create the PowerDNS image that was used to create the external DNS container image. The external DNS package and a corresponding container image are now published under the ISV Metal 3 project. As mentioned before, these images are based on SLEs, but can easily be changed to a leap tumbleweed base by changing the from entry in the Docker file. The Rancher Bare Metal project has an example of the Helm charts used to deploy PowerDNS. For external DNS, the Bitnami chart was used, but the Alpine image was replaced by the SLE OpenSUSE external DNS image. During the development, I became familiar with K9S. It is a very good TUI and I would highly recommend it. It just needs access to a cube config file. During development, it was convenient to be able to modify the Docker files to include certain tools that help verify operation and troubleshooting such as bind utils. I will now do a short demo showing you external DNS and power DNS in operation. In this sample deployment, you'll see that I already have the charts deployed. So the charts, the containers that were created based on these charts are the external DNS container here and the power DNS containers here. We'll look into these and see how they're working and then I'll show you a demo of how it automatically adds a record. If we examine the Power DNS containers, you'll see that there's actually three containers. There's the change ownership container. This was the container I mentioned that runs the change mod as a privileged user and just runs the startup and then exits. And then we have the recursor container, and we also have the Power DNS auth server. And as I mentioned, the recursor will listen on ports 53 but the auth server needs to listen on a different port. And so in this particular instance, we've configured it to listen on port 54. Port 8081 is the PowerDNS API, and that is what external DNS uses to automatically create and remove records. 
You can see also our image sources. So this one is coming from registry here, and this is the recursor 4.8, and we're using PowerDNS over here in 4.73. And as I mentioned, because these versions don't track the same, that's why we ended up having to create additional containers, one for the recursor and one for the auth server. If we look at the external DNS container, you'll see again, it has an image source in registry at opensys.org, and it's this right here. You'll notice that this container has some arguments that were provided to it, and this is how external DNS knows to integrate with PDNS server. And this is actually done within our Helm charts in the example repo that I included before. As I mentioned, this environment is already deployed. So let's look at one of the existing records. So we can see here that the name media.susa.debrymetal is resolving to this particular address. What I'm going to do is I'm going to manually delete that address from within PowerDNS directly using PDNS util. Then we'll watch external DNS detect that the address is there, the name is not there anymore. But because the service is still deployed, it will then recreate the name. Let's connect to the PowerDNS auth server container. So we can list the zone. And now we can edit the zone. As I mentioned, we'll delete one of the records. So let's delete the media record. And if we list it one more time, we'll see that media is not there anymore. Now this usually takes about 30 seconds or so and then the record will come back. So let's see if it's come back yet. And there it is, it's already back. So now let's go look in the external DNS container to see what happened. So now I would use K9S. As I mentioned, this is a nice TUI that lets you drill down. So for here, we can find the external DNS container. And then we can also do the logs. And we can scroll up and see that it created a record right here, created media. So notice that it was gone. I think we'll find that somewhere in the, the log up here, uh, that it detects that, and then it recreates it. So you can see we're polling in about every minute interval here. So at this time frame here, all the records were up to date, so it didn't have to do any work. And then at this next time frame, the records were up to date as well. But then during that time frame is when we deleted the media entry. And so now it realizes that they're not up to date and it actually runs the create to recreate the media entry. This concludes the demo part. To summarize, we were able to adapt the original bare metal solution from using external DNS with an Alpine Linux image to the Cloudflare DNS service to a OpenSUSE-based solution using PowerDNS containers, as well as putting external DNS in a container as well. This allowed us for testing and also to be able to publish our images on registry.opensuSE.org. Please let me know if you have any questions. And I thank you for your time and for listening to my presentation. I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out at me at my email address, kberger -E at susa.com. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the OpenSUSE conference.